Well, for those of you not on the East Coast, good morning. And for those of you that are on the East Coast, good afternoon and welcome to the NRC webinar, Factors to Consider When Moving to the Oracle Cloud. The agenda for today's webinar, we're going to start with introductions with both NRC as well as Wake Forest. Then we're going to just give you a brief overview of both organizations. And then we're going to talk about the actual decisions that went into the decision factors that actually went into the determination of which way to move from a SaaS solution or to go to Oracle Cloud in this case, and those particular factors. And then what we're going to do, we're going to split this up into a two-part webinar. The first part is going to be focused more on the factors of why Wake Forest decided to move to Oracle Cloud. And then the second part of the webinar is going to focus a little bit more on the implementation and what we're currently going through with the HCM Cloud implementation and the pending implementation <coughs> for Cloud ERP, as well as some of the lessons learned. And throughout the presentation, I just wanted to draw your attention here to the chat window. If you have questions and you wish to ask them, I will pause periodically throughout the presentation with John and myself to address those questions, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the conclusion of the webinar. So that being said, Mr. Bomey, would you like to introduce yourself before I do the same on the NRC side? Sure. Uh, this is John Bomey. I'm the CISO at Wake Forest Baptist Health. And to kind of put my background in perspective as it relates to this particular webinar, um, I Prior to us becoming a single clinical entity, we had a medical school and a hospital. We had two different on-prem PeopleSoft um, sites, and I was responsible for moving the two instances into one instance, which was 9.1, and was also in the, in, in the uh, project to, you know, determine if we needed to stay on-prem or move to the uh, to the, to the cloud. So that's my um, background as it relates to PeopleSoft ERP systems. Excellent. Thank you, John. And my name is Brian Morrison. I'm head of the Oracle Solutions Group practice for New Resources Consulting, and we have a long history with Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center, and we'll talk about that when we do the intro for both organizations. So, John, let's go ahead and start with Wake Forest, and then I'll do the intro from a new resources consulting perspective. Please. Very good. Um, as you can see by the, the slide, we're a fairly large academic uh, uh, medical center. Uh, we've had some recent uh, mergers and acquisitions, a large clinical group, and in a, a hospital as, as of just this past July. So we have multiple hospitals, multiple clinics, and probably an eight to nine uh, county area. Um, we've got a really nice faculty here that's, you know, kind of well known throughout the country. Um, and we have, uh, as being a medical center, we also uh, teach medical students, grad students. Uh, we have a CRNA, CRNA program and a physician assistant program. And, um, you know, we are certainly one of the first, I guess, to consider uh, going from Prem, PeopleSoft, to Oracle Cloud. Excellent. Thank you, John. And from a new resources consulting perspective, just a few bullet points. We are an Oracle Platinum partner. We have over 200 consultants nationwide now. We have been a PeopleSoft on-premise implementer for many, many years, and just recently we really have moved more to Oracle Cloud. So we have over half a dozen cloud implementations right now from an Oracle Solutions Group perspective. And then we also, as a company, we have several other practice areas. For the healthcare folks that are on the line, we have a clinical path consulting group that primarily focuses on Epic and Cerner implementations. We have a management consulting group that provides project management expertise, and we have an app dev group as well. And data sciences is also a growing initiative within the NRC suite of companies. So we do have offices. We're headquartered here in Milwaukee, but we have offices in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, as well as in Kansas City. And as you can see on the bottom, we've won a number of awards, 
and we're very proud of the fact that we've won best places to work for a number of years. The other unique thing before I get into some of the background of where Wake Forest was before they got onto the decision making process and moved to Oracle Cloud is we've been a long standing partner with Wake Forest, and I'm sure John can attest to this, but we're actually functioning as their IT group from an application support standpoint for PeopleSoft. So whether it's HCM or finance and supply chain and even campus solutions, as these pillars would dictate. Our group is working shoulder to shoulder with the WAKE folks from an IT to business perspective, and uh, we relish the opportunity to do so, and, and we'll be there for a number of years. But in addition to that, we're also part of the implementation right now to implement Oracle Cloud HCM, and we'll be involved in the Oracle Cloud ERP implementation later this fall. So WAKE Forest obviously has a very long history with PeopleSoft. They've had it for a number of years. John had attested to the school versus the hospital merger when they upgraded to 9-1. And these are the modules that they currently have. So it's a full suite of financials with asset management, billing, e-procurement, commitment control, GL, inventory, payables, to name a few, as well as the project costing module, uh, receivables, purchasing, et cetera. And then HCM, very similar. Core HR administration, e-compensation, payroll, recruiting solutions, talent acquisition management, absence management, and then the learning modules as well as a few of the campus solution modules that are currently on 9-1, specifically campus self-service, student administration, and higher education faculty management. So from a cloud perspective, there currently is not a campus solution yet, though I know they're working on that and it will be in the roadmap. So Wake is primarily focused on the HCM implementation of Oracle Cloud as well as the ERP implementation, which includes both the financial modules as well as supply chain. So, so minus the campus solution modules, these are the ones that we're focused in on from a human capital management perspective and Oracle Cloud ERP, which includes on the HCM side the payroll cloud service. And Fusion, by the way, is the old term. Oracle refers to more as Oracle Cloud, but it was the Fusion, for just for history purposes, of best of breed with PeopleSoft, J.D. Edwards, and Oracle Business Suite. So on the human capital management side, payroll, core HR, performance management, time and labor, workforce compensation, talent acquisition, and some of the other Taleo modules. And then phase two, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is the career development and uh, succession planning pieces, which will be implemented at the conclusion of HCM phase one. And then on the ERP side, again, which is the financials and supply chain portion of it, they have the invoice processing, the core financials, grants management, inventory, project costing, project financials, purchasing, which includes the self-service procurement, time and labor, and the web forms recognition, which includes the integration to RF Smart on the supply chain side. All right, so now I'm gonna turn it back over to my colleague, Mr. Bomi, to talk about the decision factors that went into determining what Wake would want to do when selecting the new SaaS solution to go from PeopleSoft on-prem to the cloud. John? Thank you. Uh, you can see the, the, some of the key variables on this slide from cost to process to cloud applications, retirement assistance, and internal resources and support. Uh, those all... Um, demanded, you know, a, a look and a review in all those spaces as it relates to as we move toward a decision. <clears throat> With the PRIM, um, and it may be different than your particular sites if you have it on site, is that um, it, our costs continue to, to go up, not only with uh, personnel, but also with the contractual model that we had as related to uh, as, as number of people uh, were added to the system 
as our um, we'd have we had a, a, a point in time with our overall enterprise revenue, and depending on where th- that was, it there was a possibility of increased uh, cost, and we just felt that that was potentially an unsustainable model for us, which uh, was actually really probably the, the stimulus for us to start determining, you know, what our next steps might be. As I mentioned earlier, we had uh, two, two PeopleSoft instances that we needed to merge into one because we became a single entity. And um, uh, we, we then looked at all of the different processes that we had in place that were pro- probably considered not best practices. And we felt like for us to gain the efficiencies of scale that we needed to be moving toward best practices. And I think in our current model, um, even though we tried to eliminate uh, custom processes when we merged the two uh, systems together, there was still a fair amount of, of custom code there, which we felt, again, was unattainable for the long term. So you can see the, the, the more specifics um, that Brian has just moved toward with cost. Uh, go on to the next uh, slide, uh, and then you see the business process change. We, we truly did want to go to more of a set uh, process, and which then, as you can guess, uh, puts a lot of, uh, of emphasis back on our organization to change our processes and move to best practices. Next slide, Brian. Um, we we did look at um, uh, other uh, SaaS solutions. Uh, we just felt that um, with with looking at both of them that at, at at this point in time that Oracle uh, really had a nice solution for us that was very scalable and that also was uh, uh, cost uh, effective for us. And then, as you can see there in the, in the, in the box area, you know, certainly being a security person as I am today, uh, that is certainly uh, a, a big factor as we look toward, you know, the cloud and the, the uh, security services that they, they offer. So we, uh, we again, with this was a key decision point for us in terms of the security of the system and, and in the, uh, of the scalable opportunities that Oracle uh, presented. Next. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, we, when we merged the two on-prem sites together, we, we did keep some custom code, and we then moved toward uh, the best practices of 9.1. But with the custom code came a fair amount of bolt-ons that we had developed over time. And, uh, for example, uh, the flu campaign, very important for us. Uh, we have to have, everybody has to have a flu shot, and how we monitor that is through a bolt-on through the current on-prem system. Faculty effort reporting, another bolt-on that we had customized uh, over time. So as we now are moving with the best practices, there are some things that we absolutely need that is not in in there, such as a flu campaign, but we uh, will be moving toward third-party applications, off-the-shelf applications that we could integrate and versus what we had done in the past is just customized. So we're we're fairly excited about moving away from some of these legacy systems. Some will just absolutely go away, and a number of them will be uh, integrated, but with third-party uh, systems. Next. Well, internal resources, as I mentioned earlier, is certainly a cost to the organization. Uh, we realize the cost of our... Uh, technical staff uh, a number of years ago when and, and Brian mentioned that his team does provide managed services uh, to 
our, our facility. So we had a staff at one point in time. We moved to a managed services, and um, that is continuing today. But to maintain good talent, it's, it's very difficult. It's very expensive. We're kind of in the Piedmont of North Carolina, and it's sometimes um, difficult to to get the trained uh, resources that we need for uh, continuity and uh, long term. So uh, the, that's always been a constraint to us, and we felt like, again, that's another decision point that long term we needed to move toward the cloud, toward more ease of operation, and to the best practices. Next. So, you know, with ongoing support, um, again, it relates a lot to the uh, personnel resources. Uh, again, the opportunity to um, work with with Oracle in the in the support mechanism. Uh, we felt like uh, we will continue to stay in the best practice uh, methodology. As you can see, the, you know, I think having access to lots of uh, clients, uh, you know, across the globe are very, very important to us. And then, you know, the the dual ability of um, multiple data centers supporting our uh, uh, instances, having the 24 by 7 support, um, as as well as the uh, the functional support, you know, is very important. And and certainly. We have that today, but it was very important that we certainly would maintain that kind of capability as we look to the cloud solution. Next. Is there another one, Brian? Fantastic. Well, okay. thank you, John. Let me go ahead and pause here for the folks on the phone. I don't see any questions coming through, Jill, via chat. But before we move on to some of the nuances associated with the cloud implementation as opposed to what I think more people are familiar with, with on-premise implementations. Let me just pause here for any questions and what you heard thus far. Okay. Well, if there are any questions, again, feel free to utilize the chat function. I'll go ahead and pause where it's appropriate. Otherwise, we will have a Q&A session at the conclusion of the webinar. So again, as I mentioned previously, the second part of this presentation webinar is going to be more focused on the actual implementation and some of the lessons learned that we've been able to gather with the implementation here at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center from an HCM perspective and some of the discovery that we've done on the ERP side. So the implementation with Oracle Cloud, just like any SaaS solution, when I say SaaS solution, by the way, that software as a service in the cloud is quite a bit different. And the reason I say that is with cloud, it's very iterative, and the solution is more of here is the existing solution, not crafting it from scratch and going through the requirements, but here's what the cloud solution does out of the box and then you as an organization will go through and determine how do you process-wise fit within the cloud solution. And in most cases, we know it's not going to be a one-to-one, -one, but you want to conform because it is based on leading and best practices to get to that point. Now, the cloud will allow you to develop what we call extensions via platform as a service, so what you hear is PaaS, but that is frowned upon because it makes it that much more difficult to maintain, and then also the testing process that goes into that whole overarching support model, which requires you to upgrade twice a year. So the cloud approach is definitely very iterative, very template, and you adopt some of the existing leading processes and practices via the solution, as opposed to the pure waterfall, highly customized, which was the case at Wake Forest, especially on the HCM side, and that's why we decided to move and focus on that platform first as opposed to financials. So again, the speed to value approach, configure, evaluate, and iterate, a lot of feedback loops, very agile-like as far as project methodology compared to the typical waterfall. 
where you begin with a pre-configured environment and then you conduct what they call familiarization workshops to go through and better understand what the system can do because it's going to be something net new anytime you implement a new software. You want to go through the training up front even before you go through the workshops and then you have these design sessions related or stemming from the familiarization workshops to figure out how you're going to configure the system to match your business processes. So the cloud is highly configurable. It certainly gives you more options than on-prem and what they call uh, personalization. So they're not customizations or tweaks to the system, but you can make it more akin to your organization and personalize it in that way. And then again, you have the constant feedback loops prior to even going into testing until you get to that end state before you go into parallel testing and then of course training and actual deployment. So our methodology at NRC is very loosely based on what Oracle is doing with their methodology called the Oracle Unified Method which includes five phases and they are project design which I mentioned contains the familiarization workshops, configuration, validation, and you have the repeat loops, that's really that iterative process really comes into play between those two phases. Then you get into transition and finally realization. And the bottom arrow with project management and change management is absolutely critical and that goes through the entire process. And we actually have a stage zero which will help you prepare the organization before you even kick off the project. And even once you're live, some of those post support type questions need to be addressed. As I mentioned, because once you flip the switch, while the cloud offers many benefits that will basically you know, <laughs> resolve some of the upgrade issues that you have with on-prem, you still have to go through those upgrades within the cloud twice a year that you have to test and any extensions that you have or any integrations that you built between third-party systems have to be validated at that point. So you want to make sure you have the right support model before you go live. All right, so the keys to success, we still have some of the critical factors, but then there's some differentiators in what you're seeing with Oracle Cloud. Okay, so project governance and scope management, that's going to be key in any implementation. And I've been doing software implementations for almost 20 years now, and that hasn't changed. Involving the users up front and through the entire life cycle of the project is still very critical. Timely decision making. If you get into analysis paralysis, depending on the time frame that you have allotted for the implementation, that can spell trouble. So you want to make sure you have the right people, attend the right meetings, that they're armed with the information to make timely decisions. Change management and training. I can't put enough emphasis on the change management and change adoption pieces because it is so different than what you're seeing with on-premise applications. So even if you're a PeopleSoft or an EBS customer and you're implementing Fusion or the Oracle Cloud solution, whether it's HCM or ERP, it is a totally different application. So the change management, change adoption piece is crucial. And as I mentioned, the upfront training prior to even attending the familiarization workshops are key. And then the data conversion and strategy, you still have to get the data from on-prem into the cloud, so that's not going to change. The decision is how much data do you actually want to convert into the cloud and how much will you have available via your on-prem application or your legacy systems. What is different is the infrastructure management. So from a technical perspective, Oracle is hosting the application. You don't have the same access that you have from a technical perspective which is good. It prevents a lot of those customizations that we talked about before, as well as the security and the uptime that John spoke about earlier in the presentation. Certainly the modern capabilities that come with the cloud, I will tell you that in our experience in working with Oracle, the new releases seem to leapfrog previous releases by quite a bit. So right now it's release 12, and I mentioned the two upgrades that need to happen twice a year. Every upgrade that comes out has a significant number of functional enhancements that you're able to take advantage of. Also, the simplified tools, and I'll add reporting to the mix as well with OTBI, are much more powerful than what we've seen, especially from a PeopleSoft perspective. That's the on-prem application that we're most familiar with, a little bit with EBS. But it's a lot easier to get at the data and actually to write 
I wouldn't call them queries because they're basically based on views. You're not actually querying the database directly, but the reports that you get and the, I'll say the analytics that are provided are much easier and it's very Excel based. And again, the personalization and customization, I even wouldn't even mention customization, but the personalization and configuration is a lot more voluminous in the cloud, gives you a lot more options than what you see in typical on-prem. Brian? Yes, sir. Can we go back to that slide for just a second? You bet. Uh, I just want to emphasize from a user standpoint uh, on the left side where it says still critical, um, the user involvement and process owners and obviously the change management piece. Um, you know, I've, I've been used to, to having our own PeopleSoft staff, uh, which were mainly technical. And when you start thinking of the cloud, you know, that technical competency is certainly minimized. And so, you know, I think for us to be effective, uh, we are planning to have functional um, subject matter experts that that are going to be in the department that can be the bridge between knowing the business functions uh, that that are in the department as and then be able to translate them to the best practices associated with the uh, the Oracle Cloud, and and so I think that's a real paradigm shift for us. But, you know, I think it really makes a lot of sense, to, you know, to have those embedded people uh, that are, you know, focused throughout your enterprise to, to make that correlation and be that functional expert that uh, I think truly will make, you, you know, be, be successful versus a technical uh, perspective as we have had in the past. Great points, John. Thank you. And we do have a number of questions that came in via chat, so I'll do my best to answer those, and then I'll open it up to anybody else on the line that wants to ask a question or continue to keep the questions flowing via chat. So the first one, which I think is pretty easy to answer, is will the presentation be available for distribution? Yes, we're actually going to put it on our OSG website within NRC, and Jill, I think you could provide some information about that and how to access the site. Yes, actually we'll do a follow-up with everyone who has been on this, um, on the presentation. We'll make sure that you have the link to the site and where the, the video will be available. We can certainly make the presentation available to you as well if you would just want the PDF. Excellent. And, Thank and, you, Jill. And, Brian, ahead. there's one other question before that. Yep. So I'm just not taking these in any particular order. But the next one from Jordania is your thoughts on migrating to the cloud from a 9.0 versus 9.2 perspective. And the good news is it doesn't matter what version you're on because Oracle Cloud demands basically that you put it into the file format that they specify. So it could be an earlier version of PeopleSoft or EBS. You have to conform to the data mapping that is dictated by Oracle Cloud to get that information into the cloud. So unlike migrating from, let's say, a 9.0 to a 9.2 or 9.1 to 9.2, and if it's an older version of PeopleSoft, let's say 8.8, going to 9.2, where you might have a double jump, or especially 8.4 via that route, the implementation with Oracle Cloud is the one-time data integration that you'll have. Now, the data cleanup related to that, obviously you want to make sure you have as clean of data as possible before you would upload to the cloud, but the actual process of implementing or importing that data is going to be the same. So hopefully that answered the question there. And then another question that came up related to what is meant by using a third-party system to replace a bolt-on. So you're still going to have your integrations to and from the cloud, right? And you can use or leverage a number, and actually we're going to get to this later on in the presentation. I wanted to show you this when we talk about integrations, and maybe that's the best place to actually visually, visually show you, but you can use a number of different 
ways to actually get the data in and out, but I think the best practice and the most common one that we've seen from an integration standpoint is utilizing Oracle SOA. That will allow you to, the information, especially when you're pulling information or you're pushing back to the cloud, to get it into the right form, and you can manage it a lot easier using the SOA tool as opposed to doing it one-off for each integration point. So I'd highly encourage you to look at the SOA portion of that, which would facilitate or better facilitation of those integrations. All right. So the next question is related to student cloud. And I will tell you, quite honestly, I'm personally not as familiar with the student side of it, and especially since that portion of it is so new. I, I will tell you that it is on the roadmap, but when that would be available from, you know, let's say you're moving from campus, PeopleSoft, that's what I'm most familiar with, to the cloud at some point, would that be included? That's a question I think I can take back to our Oracle folks, however, and see if we can't provide an answer, Jill. And then the next question is, how many test instances do you use during the implementation? And I will tell you that it's, you can pay for additional instances. And John, I believe at Wake we have the two main instances, test and prod, but I think we actually have the license for three. That is correct, yeah. We didn't know going into it, and you know, definitely there was, you know, you need two, and we, we went ahead and contracted for one more um, that will give us some flexibility as, as we continue to move forward from FHCM to finance. Excellent, thank you, John. All right, so I'm gonna go back to the presentation just for one second to address the SOA portion of it, and then just gives you a little visual of what we're doing as far as the integrations, and then I wanna to get to some of the lessons learned, if you will, that we've seen, especially on the HCM side of it, and what's up and coming for the ERP implementation. So again, this is just the visual depiction of some of the HCM modules and how we're going to interact from a push and pull perspective for the core HR benefits, payroll, time and labor, absence, and some of the other HCM modules. I'm not gonna read all of these here, but this is just a visual depiction of, of how we're gonna do that. And then on the ERP side, which we haven't started that project yet, very similar to what we're trying to do with SOA. Now, Wake does have their own, I'll say, proprietary tool, HealthStream, which functions pretty much the same way. So I don't know if there's other healthcare organizations that use that but the leading practice, most certainly, as I mentioned, would be SOA and utilizing the features for that integration tool. But you could do it one-off as well. But what I really want to get to is the, just the high-level timeline of what we estimated, what it's going to take to implement. For the HCM project, we actually kicked off that engagement last summer, and we're expected to go live January 1 of 2018. So it's an 18-month project, and on the financial side, or the ERP side, which is financials and supply chain, we expect that that project will be in basically a similar duration, but possibly a little bit sooner when we go live with the ERP side. But what I really wanted to get to, which I'm just going to fast forward here, are the lessons learned. So we talked a little bit about some of the key decision factors that John had described in detail, but I just wanted to highlight from what we've seen, and these are fairly high level, and I can get to some of the other technical components of it if there's any questions regarding that uh, as well, but the team focus and participation. In order to make timely decisions, which you'll see in a later bullet point here, you have to have the team involved throughout the entire life cycle. And you're gonna have key, what we'll call subject matter experts, or the people that really know the application are gonna be supporting the application once they go live, both from a business perspective, as well as from, we will call it an IT perspective, so you can provide, especially on the business analyst side, but even the technical side, for support. And the technical piece really comes into play, I believe, after the conversion, you're gonna make sure that is as clean as possible, but the ongoing maintenance of those integrations and the report writing is certainly key from a technical perspective, okay? Organizational change management and change adoption. Remember, this is a totally different application. This is not an upgrade 
from a 9.0 oh to 9.2 or 9.1 to 9.2 from a PeopleSoft perspective. This is the implementation of a net new application, which basically necessitates a change management plan, getting the users involved early and often, make sure that you're selling it throughout the process so there's no surprises when you go live. And I would strongly suggest that you keep that team involved, not only in the workshops as well as testing, but even some of the UAT or try to bring in a larger audience if you can. So it's not the first time they've seen that. And as mentioned previously, even before you start the implementation, you want to make sure that you go through the training up front so you really can hit the ground running when you enter into those familiarization workshops. Okay? Team turnover, some of this you can't plan for. Uh, we did have some issues on the wake side, and certainly for the implementation team, we've adapted and recovered for that. But for a longer-term project, that's going to happen. I mean, that is a, a necessary evil that you need to address. And operational readiness. So you could actually have this system completely buttoned down and ready to go live. But if you're, again, it goes back to the organizational change management, change adoption piece. If the users aren't ready to begin transacting in the way that cloud necessitates, then you're going to run into a ton of problems once you go live. So again, the sooner you can expose them to the system, the sooner you get involved in the workshop and the design sessions as part of the implementation, the better off you're going to be once you enter into the deployment phase. Brian, I, I would also state that as, as you all are going through these bullet points that Brian is articulating, is that a, uh, a well-planned communication uh, strategy needs to be developed sooner than later, uh, not only for the core team, but any impact to the enterprise, such as you know payroll or self-service and, and things like that, because you know when you can get this out and, and you can be, you can tell the users, you know, you're going to go left versus you've been going right for all these many years. Again, that gives more socialization and it, it actually can help, I believe, get more uh, understanding it than when the system does turn over. Absolutely agree. So just to round this out, the last two bullet points, the leads and certainly the subject matter experts that I was referring to before. I mean, decision making is absolutely crucial, but you need to make sure they have enough information. They've gone through the trend. They actually understand what they're deciding within the configuration, right? So, and some of this is the implementation partner, certainly, which is the last bullet point, that they come to the table with recommendations and best practices and what they've seen. That makes it that much easier for the client to decide which direction to go. And then the last one, of course, as I mentioned, you want to choose the right implementation partner. Uh, the one thing I would caution you on is if it's a large-scale implementation, which I think a lot of the folks on the line here come from very prestigious, very uh, large-scale organizations, these implementations are not easy. And do not, please do not underestimate the change management, change adoption component of the implementation, and to help facilitate that, we strongly believe that the implementation partner needs to spend as much time on-site as possible. I know with the cloud, some of that can be done remotely, but for the business users in going through the workshops, understanding what it means to actually make a configuration decision, and just as importantly, the, the actual downstream impact or ramification of making that configuration decision, what does that mean once you go live? So we believe that you need to have a lot of on-site presence from the consulting group and actually working shoulder to shoulder with the client, uh, not doing all of it remotely. So, so that's really what I would caution you on. I know there's a, a ton of partners out there. Uh, we've done several ourselves, which is good, and we're partnered with OCS and some larger firms with a, a couple of, I mentioned Wake Forest, we're at Cedars-Sinai, UW Health, we've been a Manitowoc company, City of Atlanta, to name a few. But just be careful when you choose your implementation partner. And because it is net new, you want to make sure that you have the right group supporting you, not only during the implementation, but afterwards as well. So, Jill, going back to the chat, was there any other additional questions that we did not address? 
Actually, there is, Brian. There's two or three questions that we've just received in the last um, few minutes. I think the okay. last one you had done was in regards to the student cloud. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so the next one you would have is the how many test instances do you use during the implementation? Yep, so we talked about that. And, and WIC has the three. Typically, Oracle will provide you the two, but you certainly can license additional instances. Let me, now that I'm back here, so I'm looking through the questions. John, I think you probably can answer this. So Wake Forest Baptist Medical Health internal IT structure look like now? I mentioned that NRC is, is actually doing the application support for PeopleSoft and we'll be doing the same once we flip the switch and go live in January with the cloud, but certainly it's a lot more than that. And I, the question is, is everything managed services support or just the administrative system support? Well, it is. Um Managed Services provides the uh, functional and technical support of the on-prem, whereas uh, we still have our own people managing the databases and associated uh, server infrastructure. But anything related to uh, configuration uh, and support of the on-prem is now with uh, NRC Managed Services. Thank you, John. And then the last question I'm seeing here, Jill, for Wake Forest Baptist Health, were there other systems vendors that you considered, such as Workday, Lucian Lawson, et cetera? And the answer is yes. And it really came down to, and John, please elaborate on this, but from my perspective, what I saw in, in working with Wake was it was between Oracle and Workday. And the reason why, one of the main reasons why that Wake decided to move the needle more toward the Oracle Cloud solution was looking at functionality. On the HCM side, I thought from what I'd seen, the two applications were fairly comparable, both pretty strong in that area. But when you look at it holistically, on the finance side, at least when we went through this process a little over a year ago or almost a year and a half ago now, the Workday product really did not have a strong financial solution and did not at that point in time have a supply chain component to it. So holistically, from an enterprise perspective, Oracle was the better choice. Yeah, I, I agree with that. We, I tacitly looked uh, at Lawson. We did do a deep dive with uh, Workday, as, as, as Brian mentioned, and uh, we just felt that uh, as we looked at our longer term, both on HCM and ERP, which is finance supply chain, that the route was uh, significantly better with the uh, Oracle Cloud uh, perspective. Excellent. Thank you, John. So let me just open it up for other questions on the call that we didn't address yet. And Joe, maybe before I, we get to that, if there's other questions that you have, can you talk about the ways that you can get those questions to us pertaining to Oracle Cloud or other questions you have regarding functionality or the implementation Etc. Absolutely. If you would like for our group to, to take a question and provide a response to you, if you could send it to me at jmeans at gonrc.com, that is who you should have received your invitation from for the, for the webinar. If you will provide that information to me, I will ensure that you will get an answer to your question. Excellent. Thank you, Jill. Any other questions on the call? Pertaining to what you had seen here or other questions that you formulated throughout the webinar? Okay, well I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Certainly appreciate the questions and the input. Hopefully you learned a little bit about what went into the decision-making process for Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center to go the Oracle route and decide to implement both HCM and Oracle Cloud ERP. Uh, I'm sorry, was there another question? Someone else trying to chime in? Okay. Well, thanks everyone. We appreciate it. And again, any other questions that you have Please forward those questions to jmeans at goenrc.com, 
and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you.